I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on ThinkTechHawaii.com. And this is a very special show for me today. As you know, I'm always out there trying to find respect in the chaos. Well, I'm here with my brother, and there's some serious respect in this chaos that he has found out there in the world. And I am absolutely honored to be able to say that I'm his little sister because he has some programs in Africa that we're going to talk about today. So Jake, I want to welcome you. This is Jake Sinclair, Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Jake Sinclair. And uh, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks so much for being here. This is really exciting for me. My pleasure. <clears throat> I, uh, I know that most everybody out there knows um, about some of the the dysfunctional family stuff that I dealt with growing up, and yet we have, as a brother and sister, rose above that and and made something good in the world out there. And so that's what I want to talk about today is all the, the good that you are doing out there in the world. So we've got the school that you started. Well, see, Louis, the first thing you did out of medical school, right, was the um, Youth Industries, which was an outreach program for street kids in San Francisco, right? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you you helped so many kids. You had like an 87% success rate or something like that. It was just phenomenal success rate. It's hard to measure success amongst that very challenged and damaged population. Very high. Right. Yeah. Very high is right. No, very high success rate, oh. but we don't know what it is. We didn't do actual research. Oh, oh okay. Um, but I know it was amazing. You had so many of you. The thing that was so great about it was that it wasn't just a place for kids to come flop. You gave them jobs. There was a cafe, Einstein's Cafe, and the New to You thrift store and the Petal Revolution, right? Couple thrift stores, yeah. Oh, a, couple a thrift restaurant, stores. Restaurant, yes. A bike shop. A bike shop's still there, actually. Uh, still cool. helps homeless kids, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. How long ago was that? A long time ago. Like twenty years. Twenty years ago, yes. Wow. So after that, you started into was it Ujima that started right away, or was it Manassas Children that started next? Those are the, Manassas Children is the USA nonprofit, and Ujima is the. Africa NGO, which is the equivalent to a nonprofit. Right, the non government organizations, right? NGOs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so tell us about Manassas Children. What was that? It was a school, right? Well, there, it's all a continuum, uh, a learning continuum. Uh, I would say that we made every stupid mistake you could make as white people <laughs> in the first about four years when we went to Africa. We went to Kenya. I had worked there as a medical student. And we tried to duplicate the program we had in America working with street kids. Okay. And that was my first mistake, is <laughs> trying to duplicate anything that works in America is challenging because the infrastructure, uh, the, the societal setup, cultural norms, et cetera, are so different. But we did try to take kids from the street. At that point in time, it was a big issue there in Nairobi, Kenya, um, up country to relatives and put them in school. And uh, I mean, there's some great successes. There, there is still a feeding program that feeds 12,000 school kids every day. Big nutritious meal, wow. much of which they take home. Built a built a big high school there, a big public high school. Um, yeah, there's 600 kids go to that. Half of them are orphans. That's good. That's uh, amazing. But what we found over time is that we also built a safe house for girls because uh, sexual assault there is. Uh, terribly common, especially amongst orphans who are not protected. And you know some statistics about that, right? I do, yeah. And what are um, some of the statistics for that? Well, the most interesting statistic is that we were, we felt compelled to go to Africa to help orphans because at that point in time, it was 20 years ago, there were 6 million AIDS orphans. 6 million, wow. Yes, that's what we said because that's the Holocaust number. So, yeah. so we turned to each other and said, if we don't do something, then our grandchildren will shame us. Like, oh my gosh, there was a Holocaust in your generation. You did nothing. And it was on the cover of Time Magazine or Newsweek and everybody heard about it. Now there are 20 million AIDS orphans and nobody hears a whisper. Wow. Yeah. Man, so you went to make some changes, and you have. You've made some amazing successes over there. Well, after the 
I call them stupid white people mistakes. Okay? Stupid white people first, mistakes. That's first funny. four years because we do. We try to project our culture or what works in our society onto another culture, and there are always problems with that. Right. There are often sure. problems with that, and so all of the things that we do, including even a feeding program, even a school buying school uniforms, sponsoring kids, ultimately they perpetuate the most damaging thing that I've seen in Africa, which is dependency. All right. Yeah. I like that. So you think, you think you're doing good, and you are to some extent, but you're also crippling people at the same time. Right. So what did you do about that? How did you address that? Well, first we had to figure it out. Um, everybody, <laughs> first we had to listen to people. I think the right. most difficult thing for, for Americans in particular, because we, are, we tend to be know-it-alls, <laughs> and uh, we tend to want an instant credit card fix. That's our thing. Right. Uh, so we try things, and I think the biggest difficulty is that people aren't honest with why they're there. Um, I'm a Christian, as an example. I think we might be the worst in that we go there as like we're serving God, and we are in a sense, um, but we're also serving ourselves, and it's hard for us to admit that. Right. Like a big part of why we're there is to feel good about ourselves. And if you're unable to acknowledge that, you oftentimes can't sift through the multicultural obstacle and de right. debilit debilitation that you're not rehabilitation, debilitation, if that's a word, that um, you're actually causing in that culture. So I think the first thing was to really be humbled and uh, begin to listen to what the people of that society were telling us. and. Uh, it's difficult for them also to have a clear, honest voice because, right. hey, you're the best thing since sliced bread. You know, it's like, whoa, this is like my kid's school fees. And a lot of times in some of these schools, uh, when there were droughts, which were frequent, kids would not eat for two, three, four days. You'd go to a school, there'd be 400 kids, and you'd say, how many of you haven't eaten yesterday? Just about everybody. How about two days, half of them? Up to like six days, so you can oh imagine, yeah, kids would go to school and just fall asleep. I mean, yeah. just wander outside the classroom and lay down. It's that difficult. So somebody like me shows up and it's like Candyland. Um, right. So it's really hard to get to people who recognize the bigger picture in that society and can say, hey, wait a right. minute, you know, all this buying things is not necessarily in the best long-term uh, future for that child sure. or even this village. So I would say after four years, we kind of figured out like, wait a minute, there are different levels of, and there's also a, a tremendous amount of corruption in Africa. Every, oh my gosh, everyone I didn't knows think about of that, of yeah, course. Yeah, everyone knows about it. So the first level of cor corruption that you run into is the basic corruption, which is you meet a group of people and you're all dedicated to helping. Oftentimes we're all Christians and we're all feeling like we're in the faith together. And then like you give them, uh, $500 to buy a huge pot to cook the food in for a school, for example, but the pot only cost $250. And then we began to notice that our main guy started to have these new vans. And had oh, this, dear. Like, bus service. <laughs> We're like, wait a minute. <laughs> so, yeah, so seeing seen through that first level of corruption, which is very common. And then the second level is like gatekeeper corruption. So as you go into a village uh, or, or a town, um, a district, for example, and you are giving resources to a uh, school teacher, a school principal, um, you, you really empower them in the community in ways you don't know. So the people sure. then are beholden to them. And oh, they, right. yeah, so then they begin to kind of push and assert their will on that community. They begin to hire their relatives. They begin to, sure. so there are a lot of things that are very subtle that you don't know because most of the time when Americans go there, I'll, I'll switch from white people to Americans, but it's common. You can common. call them white people. Yeah, okay. well, well, Amer <laughs> we call them Howies here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a good, a good society to talk about this. We uh, we actually spend a lot of time on on racism there, but it's in a re reverse order. We teach a course called White People 2.0. Um, white people 2.0. That sounds great. And I, I like and that. I, and I have to take black people 2.0. And that you know, learning the African <laughs> culture is it's an uphill battle. I just have sure. all these assumptions, and then the same right. is true in reverse. And so we're trying to educate each other around our pitfalls and foibles, and so that we can, when we're communicating, sure. you know, come up with the best plan, right. uh, ir irrespective of self-interest. That's our goal. Uh, in any case, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the second part, this gatekeeper corruption we overcame 
having seen it happen right in front of us. And then we're left with like, well, what do we do that's not going to kind of continue to perpetuate the dependency sure, syndrome? Exactly. What, what happens? And it turns out in, in, in Africa, orphanages are businesses. And the, and the commodity is the kids and, oh. and uh, Americans' sympathy. Right. So you've got, it's complex. I mean, there's, these are orphans. They are in desperate situations. Problem is, if you, if you build an orphanage, they're, they're ultimately cheap to build. Americans love to build things. That's another thing about us. We love, to like, we love quick, and we love anything we can see. So uh, right? uh, you build an orphanage. It's relatively cheap to build, but it's very expensive to maintain. Mm. So over time, uh, people aren't as interested. They stop sponsoring the kids, and the kids are still there. You know, four or five years later, you come in with an eight-year-old kid. They're twelve, and their sponsor drifts off. And what are you going to do? Right. Um, so a- in addition to that kids that do grow up in the context of an orphanage have been disconnected from their community. So they grow up right. and you send them to school. I mean, there are many kids that I sent to school and paid school fees for and felt really good about myself, but what do they do when they're 18? Right. How do you get a job? Yeah. Who, I mean, in America, Where that's the question. Where are you going to work? Well, no, but Even how, here in America, how do you get a job? <laughs> no, I mean, like, <laughs> normally in America, you get a job through your friends or oh, oh, your I parents you or right, your family. Sure. Or like, and right, that's right. Your, your first jobs are through your connections. And we've ultimately disconnected them from their community connections. Oh. So there's not just a long-term life sustainability empowerment aspect to that. Mm-hmm. It's very like, let me come in and help you take care of you, paternalistic. Uh, so that's that's kind of what it's really hard to break free from because the need is so immediate and you love these kids and you just want to do good and help. Right. And then you have to like take a step back and go, what's really important for this kid, this really helping them, yeah. village, this town, this yeah community. So, so the, the the next big thing that we well we should, so then we went to microloans. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, and I b- completely believe in microloans, microfinance. Explain what those are. So well, that's, that for the people that don't know exactly what a microloan is, yeah, that's explain the, you what know, that is. Give a, give a person a fishing, you know, give a person a fish, you feed them for a day, a fishing pole, you feed them for a lifetime. So it's like right. enabling people to overcome just a simple capital barrier that we take for granted here in America. I mean, if you want to, like, start a small business, a fruit stand or uh, a taxi business, you know, you, you ask your uncle. They you know, stand. Got yeah. money, yeah, whatever. And it's like, <laughs> come on, give me five thousand bucks, I'll buy a car, or you know, give me give me two hundred bucks, I'll, I'll buy some lace, and and that's even two hundred bucks, even fifty bucks in Africa is an insurmountable obstacle. So to get a business wow. going, you just need like somebody to believe in you, but right. you have no collateral, right? Here sure. you need some kind of, you need an uncle that's rich. Well, nobody has that. Yeah, certainly, right. if you're an orphan, <laughs> or you need some collateral, they have neither. So. Right. Uh, this is the, the Green Bank um, uh, pioneered this. This is everybody does these now. So you find a group of women. It used to be ten. Now it's five. Band them together and give them all uh, fifty dollars or a hundred dollars. Okay, and and they all go out and start business. They have to write you know business plans, get business training. Oh, they do. Set. They have to oh, actually yeah, apply. A, there's for a process. Like, you put it. It's, yeah. it's a it's a six to ten week training program that you put oh, them through. Oh, nice, which is and just as important as the money. Absolutely. And right. Right, learning to do your finances, et cetera. So you, you give them a microloan, uh, and the, the catch is, if all of you don't pay it back, none of you get the second loan. Oh, so if the first what? loan's $100, the second's $200. But if four are successful and pay back the loan and one doesn't, nobody gets the money. Oh, so they, like, police each other. Exactly. Well, you could say police, well, which is... It's not exactly the right word. No, but peer yeah. pressure. Nothing's more powerful peer than peer yeah, pressure. Yeah, no kidding. So, and they help each other. The other part of it is that they, they also, you know, whoa, she's not, you know... And they Jane want Ota them to be successful. Well. Exactly. Yeah, so, so it creates so, a community, exactly. a whole system within it. That's so amazing. Okay, we got more to talk about, but we got to take a break. So uh, we will just be gone for a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, here with my brother, Dr. Jake Sinclair, and I hope you'll come back and join us for the second half. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your everyday. 
so protect your everyday. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on thinktechhawaii.com, and this is my brother, Dr. Michael Jacob Sinclair, and I'm so happy to have him here. And I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor, okay, before we get started into the second half of this uh, episode. There's a program that I learned about when I went around the world called the White Ribbon Campaign, and it asks men to get involved in the, um, the awareness part and the, uh, of domestic violence and child abuse and what it is is it's asking men to stand up to the men uh, uh, men that don't abuse to stand up to the men that do is basically what it is and it's all about taking a pledge where you, the pledge is I will not commit condone or keep silent about violence against women and girls and I have a feeling you'd be willing to wear this ribbon huh cool man <laughs> thank you very much so you got to take the pledge though I will not commit condone or keep silent about a abuse against women. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, now let's go back to what we were talking about before. Well, I think because you just showed that video. Oh yeah, that's a Thank good. You. That's a good segue because that. So that video is a, uh, is a. Uh, it has forty six million views at this point. Forty six million. Million views, yeah, and uh, so we call it the Weinstein effect, and it and it's related to the white ribbon campaign or the you know Me Too no campaign. No means no, and I mean uh, uh, Ojima, Me Too, yeah. Except, yeah. So, uh, in any case, that we realized uh, after having overcome, I was going on a little long about the dependency syndrome thing, but the, uh, the, uh, the microloans were also really helpful for women who are victims of domestic violence. Oh, okay. um, and what we did is, and this is one of the first people to do this, they did this in South Africa, they did it in Ivory Coast, uh, in Bangladesh. In some cultures it doesn't work actually, but you do a dual empowerment program with women who are victims of domestic violence. It's called Intimate Partner Violence, IPV, in, right. in other countries. And uh, many of the women that came to us, or many of the chiefs, elders, et cetera, said, like, you gotta help these women. I, I personally witnessed it. Women would come in with machete cuts and terribly beaten, and wow. they uh, lodge a complaint with the police, and two days later, they'd withdraw it. Right. They had to feed their kids. Um, so I, I know that, we know that, you know, we were victims of rape, violence in our childhood. And when it's your caretaker or in that example, when it's your, your kids, you know, that you, you can't just take them out of that situation because they'll starve or they'll lose their place in school and no right. school fees. So people told us, including the chief and the police, et cetera, it's like, if you give them a job, then they'll be able to leave, they'll be independent. So we took the microloan program and we shifted it to help women victims of domestic violence. And it was incredibly successful. Nice. The unique thing about our program, the Ujamaa program, that's developed out of that, you know, trying to 
not foster dependency, but no. empower. Ujamaa, is that a word? It is. Uh, that me, is it, I mean, an African word? It's is an, that? Yes, it's an African, it's a Swahili word. Swahili Ujamaa, word. it means together we can succeed. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, Sorry, so, I didn't interrupt, but I wanted to know what that meant. No problem. And uh, so we, we have done all this research. That's what's unique about our program is that one is we're focused on stopping violence against women and girls. Um, but two is we're focused on the prevention side of that, and we have research to prove that it works. So we published seven papers with Stanford and Johns Hopkins, um, and in, in all these papers, we show that we've cut rape in half after we've taught. Half? We've taught hundreds of thousands of girls, and uh, hundreds of thousands of girls have now used, and women have used these skills that we teach to prevent themselves from being raped. And what are the skills? Well, Self-defense? Well, let me first talk about okay, this video, sorry. because okay. they, uh, uh, they, we also use, you can't really use self-defense in a domestic violence situation. You can only oh, yeah, like right. karate chop your husband one time, you know, and then you're out. So, <laughs> so this economic empowerment piece was really important, and we, and we have a study that we did with Stanford that shows that we cut domestic violence by 65 percent. Other studies have shown it cut by 50 percent. The other studies I mentioned, and so we thought, well, yeah, of course, the woman has. Uh, money now she can support her kids and she moves out, but that's actually not the case. They don't leave, and we're we're doing further studies to figure out how it actually works. Some of the things we found we did not expect is that the husband doesn't beat the wife because she's the breadwinner now. He values. Oh her. yeah, yeah. even think about that. Yeah. Oh she, wow. She she holds a place of respect, and so that the way they carry themselves in that relationship changes. Uh, <sighs> she's not in the house as much. There's not as much opportunity to fight. If she's just around the house, they're both around the house. It's so so it's it's complex, but. But it's really interesting how well it works. Now we have that just economic empowerment has not proved to be enough. We also have support groups. So we have a 12-step support group that women go into. Uh, it's called Tuponi Pamoja, Together We Heal. And a lot of it has to do with, and I learned this from, again, being a rape, uh, child abuse survivor, you go into these meetings and you don't know how it works, but somehow like telling your story to sympathetic others who have been through the same situation is healing. It is. You know, I always say that, guys. You hear me say that all the time. There's healing in the telling. It's exactly right. There's healing in the telling. Absolutely. So a lot of these women have gone their whole life um, victims of domestic violence and never told anyone, even their neighbor. It's hard breaking when you, you, I, you can only sit in these groups if you're part of it too. It's like only, it's not like a social worker or a psychologist counselor thing. It's like, it's a group of women. It's free, right? Because they're just lay trained people and they help each other. Yeah. So that was really successful. But we also, from the prevention side, most of the money that goes into stopping violence against women and children goes into aftercare. And there's not, in Africa, one in four high school girls where we work are raped every year. One every in four year. every year. Not like in their lifetime, like America, every year. So it's, Every year? It's, yeah, it's astonishing. So one girl could be raped. Every four girls Ten you're times. looking at in high school. Oh, yeah, and multiple times. Oh, it's, it's horrifying. So there's not enough money in the world to, and I, as a survivor, I know I'm 63 years old. I'm still recovering. There's not enough money in the world to help all these girls uh, that are, victims of sexual violence. We have to prevent it. That's our initial theory, okay, our hypothesis. So, and then the rest of the money goes into these awareness campaigns and rallies. And they don't work. They've proven, I mean, billions of dollars into it. It's like rapists don't attend those. Um, right, yeah, yeah, right. So it's like <laughs> people aren't really thinking it through. So we're, we're to our knowledge, we're the only program that's had a, a, a wide or a broad based prevention program that teaches hundreds of thousands of girls. And like I said, it cuts rape in half. So you ask about what the skills are. A lot of them, it's just boundary setting, awareness, assertiveness. Uh, and then, you know, if it comes down to it, and we always say this, your last option is even physical self-defense. So there's like, you know, the four primary targets. Right. These are brutal special forces, Israeli Mossad techniques for a girl to disable the attacker and get away. And the get goal away. is always to get away. Uh, so we teach those in schools, but what the video showed is like the real problem is the men, right? And if you want to work with men, you need to start with boys. That's sure. our other assumption or theory hypothesis. Teach so, them when they're so, young. Start so, them young. Yeah. That's so we right. also have have a program um, called Your Moment of Truth, or now we've shifted. It's called The Hero and Me. And what oh, we do is, yeah, we, instead like of that. yeah, teenage boys don't really respond well to teenagers in general. Like you're going to be punished. It's wrong. So, and so this is the opposite of that. We're appealing to the good side of the boy. Nice. 
and all boys want to be heroes. Right. We just to help help them understand like this is your sister, could be your mother, and so that they want to heroically intervene. So we did a big study on that. It's also been published, and uh, in the year following the, the classes that we teach, 72% of the boys successfully intervened to prevent a girl from in the middle of a sexual or physical assault. Yeah, it was only 22% in the control group. So we've done big RCTs, or randomized control trials, 10,000 kids, and we've, we've had these findings duplicated again and again. Now we work in Kenya and Malawi, and we just started working in Somalia and South Sudan. So our, our big thing is like, the real, if you want to make a change in sexual assault and violence against women and girls, the, there's just not enough money to like change the infrastructure. The courts take right. forever. You can pass as many laws as you want. Sure. The power is in the girl. Right. Girls are incredibly powerful. They just need permission and some skills. That's and boys right. want to be heroes. They want to be good. You know, they right. just they just need to shift these negative gender norms. And that's what you saw in that video. And uh, we also found in the study that in the the initial baseline boys thought if I take a girl on an expensive date, I have a right to have sex with her. Uh, if a girl wears a miniskirt, I have a right to have sex with her. And after the classes, uh, that shifted. Uh, it, it flipped. There were 80% said yes in the beginning, and now 80% said no at the end. And it was durable. It lasted up to a year. And how long is so the class that the guys it's go there, through? Both the girls and the boys' classes, there are six classes, two hours long each. Oh, wow. That's a good. Yeah, it's a good chunk. So you're in, like, all the schools? now in Nairobi and we've taught in all the schools in Nairobi that's uh, that's a population in the slums okay that's a population of two million people two million people yeah that's almost hard to fit in my head yeah wow. so we have a big staff we have 150 people full-time people on our staff all all African staff I'm the last white guy standing and they just keep me around because <laughs> I'm standing. old yeah <laughs> but anyway so yeah that's that's our story that's that's a story that we would want to share with people is that you know you, you really the boys and girls are where you need to make a difference in society. We're looking for like right. community-wide generational change. Right. Uh, quick fixes don't work, especially in something like this. I mean, sexual violence is just, it's too complex a problem. It's, it's interwoven into the society. So you start with young people, students, right. and uh, we teach in schools because that's where you can reach the most of them cost-effectively. Right. And, and you see in even communities over time, because Girls teach their sisters. They teach their classmates. It spreads throughout the community, right. and you can. We, we've cut the incidents of sexual assault, even in girls that have never taken the class. We go to a new school, okay, and like if we were taught in that high school three, four years ago, we go to freshman, and it's been cut in half. So that's our. So it's already message. starting to just spread like wildfire. That is so exciting. Oh my gosh, exciting! I. I just can't even imagine. It's, it's like, I'm related to you. What am I doing? <laughs> I'm just working on my little corner. That's my sister talking. Yes, anyway, it's your it's, sister it's talking. It's not, it's, yeah, it's not about me. It's more, it's about the fact that, you know, girls are powerful. Yeah. Boys want to be good. That's the most beautiful message. I just love that message. I, uh, I'm not quite sure how much more time we've got here, but, um, I know that it's it's getting close. So, um, do you have one last thing that you'd like to maybe really um, make sure all my viewers kind of know about this program and how maybe they can help? Even um, to, what what can we do? You know, what what can we do here at home to try to help you? Well, yeah, I do have one last thing I'd like to share with the audience, which is my sister's awesome. Aww. She's totally awesome. <laughs> she also came from the same childhood, and she's built an amazing life for herself, and that's possible. For anybody out there who's been abused, um, we were severely abused. It's like, hey, you can, like, you know, don't give up, and you can turn that into something powerful and good in your life. That's right. That's exactly right. Oh, my gosh, Jake, I'm just... I am so honored to be your sister, and I'm just so honored that you came. Likewise, ditto. To, honored to be your brother. <laughs> and it's just, I, this has been um, the most amazing thing. I just graduated from college last night, you guys, and my, my brother has come from the mainland and, and his busy, busy life to be here with me for this momentous occasion. Who would have thought I'd wait till I was 60 to get a college degree, but that's okay, man. 
I am living graduating proof that it's never too late. And and we are living proof that you don't have to suffer alone and there is hope and healing out there. Reach out and find it and keep reaching out until you find it. Um, Thank you so much for being with us here today on Finding Respect in the Chaos on thinktechhawaii.com. I am Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and I hope that you will join me on the next episode of Finding Respect in the Chaos. Thanks a lot.